First of all, I want to thank the brilliant presentation of uh, uh, Tania and uh, Selwyn. Very informative presentation. I can say that is the first time I am really aware of the place and the role of uh, a biodiversity uh, inf informatics uh, institution, let's say, in the landscape of a, a country. Uh, what I understand is that, uh, uh, let's say, Sambi is a, a successful case, and Sambi uh, uh, is at the crossroads of uh, scientists, uh, let's say, policy and decision makers, and also population. Uh, generating also supporting knowledge gener generation and bringing all this into let's say useful uh, useful information to support a decision uh, at uh, various levels it's a, for me it's a very big challenge and I would like to know to let's say to get and to bring the scientists on board every time to achieve let's say, uh, priorities of agenda. It must be a very big challenge. And I would like to understand how, let's say, they successfully uh, try to work together with scientists in the case of, for instance, biodiversity assessment. Because you are, you are, not, you are not doing science, but you work with scientists. How do you get them on board? You, and to and try to achieve, for instance, uh, the, the biodiversity assessment in your in your country, and also many other activities. I would like you to, let's say, to to give details of this so that um, I can uh, get clear ideas of how we can work with scientists uh, at the biodiversity info informatics uh, institute level, for instance. And uh, also, let's say for policy makers, you, you show case of this, how you go to parliament and talk to them and so on. So it's, uh, let's say, clear. But for scientists to be on board, remain on board, and support your agenda, please um, tell me concretely how it works. Uh, it's a journey, a long journey, and as they say in English, it's not a silver bullet. And, and I'd like Les to also talk who's at the other end of that, because at least the example of a scient scientist and a scientific institution in an academic institution like University of Cape Town. Uh, how we have, I mean, is an example of how we have over the years developed a good relationship. But I think there are four things. The first thing is you must retain your scientific capacity and standing and status. You cannot lose that altogether. So we have scientists at SAMBI who are renowned scientists, like Professor Jonelson, uh, Guy Midgley, uh, others like Brian Mantlana, who continue to produce science in, in, in science journals. So you must, for, scientists don't respect non-scientists. So you have to retain that. But they also have to learn to multitask. So the type of scientists you have are those that are like women, women who multitask. Men are not so good at it. <laughs> they do the science. They do the science well. But they also have developed ability to have relationships with others and to see the bigger picture. So in a way, you have to have a journey with them to say, we're an institution, but we're not a science institution. We're a hybrid. We're an institution that takes science and gives it to policy makers and decision makers. That's our role. 
so it's also about the skill set of the scientists. You really need the type of scientists who see big picture, who see the bigger picture, uh, see the vision at the end of protecting biodiversity, and that the, the important action is to take the data from other people and to put it into a form that will then indeed achieve the end result. Then it helps to have legislation. That one line is not obligatory. It doesn't obligate institutions to work with us. But when we are really in a corner, we can waive that legislation and say, look there, in the legislation passed through our parliament, it says SAMBI must manage and give access to biodiversity information. We use that a little bit. And then thirdly, is oiling the wheels a little bit with money? So when we have got money, we, or when we have access to money, we, we work together with our partners to go and get, say, money. For example, we're working together with our observation environment network, which is a satellite observation, to go together to the science and technology budget vote. Be, uh, so that th there's an example of a partner or we, when we did our GMO work, we did it together with Free State University. They have the people and, uh, the, and the capacity and we, were, and we are able to harness funding. When you are poor, if you are able to lay that foundation of good friendship and relationship, then when you are poor, the partnership continues you know, through richer and poorer. That's your aim, is to have a richer, whether you are rich or poor. But I must say, money does help. But you know, many of us don't necessarily have access to that money. So it, but, and it's not a one-off event. Um, it's, it's, it's something that you constantly have to feed that fire. So we might work together, and, and Les is just showing me the, we've just done the, the, the bird mapping and ADU's information, and we've produced an atlas, and now we're going for the mammal map, uh, also with, with a bunch of partners. So you have to keep that partnership alive with product that you jointly own, and so it, it helps your relationship. It's a bit like having children. It's good for the marriage to have to have output like that. So it's a number of things. But I wondered whether, you know, as a partner of SAMBI, whether you can't also have a view of this. Yeah, so, so how, how do you get academics involved? I, I, I wish I knew the answer to that, because I've got to try and get academics at UCT involved with me as well. Um, so I would describe myself as a fairly, um, fairly rebellious um, academic. My father was a civil servant, and he was a fairly rebellious civil servant as well, in the sense that he, he didn't act like a civil servant. So it's, it's, this year it's 40 years since I got my ruddy PhD, and my PhD was on um, further distributions of multivariate quadratic forms. 40 years ago, all I can say, 40 years have gone by, and all I can say is that I solved a problem that nobody's ever had. and. Um, and that, I rebelled against that pretty quickly, and I decided I had to work with uh, you know, practical, practical stuff. I had an interest in biodiversity, which had been fostered by my father when I was a, a kid, and so somehow that, that took root. And um, it's very, very hard to actually replicate that. And so it's, it's really, it's a, it's, a, it's a chance set of circumstances. But I think, I think what I've learned, and, and, and this is what I think makes me rebellious with my colleagues, is that, uh, is that I've learned that, that when you do research, what you ought to be doing is actually solving the real problems of the day. And I think you have to encourage academics to actually get solving useful pro problems, not researching the, the, the left leg of the frog 
right, as Tanya was saying earlier on. So you, you want to do things which are, are interesting. So I'm a, I'm a statistician by training. I got slung out of the stats department at the University of Cape Town because I said statistics has got no right to exist. Biology has a right to exist. Astronomy, geology, statistics only exists in the service of other disciplines. And they didn't like that. So I got slung out into the zoology department, now the biological sciences department. Librarians don't exist either. Uh, librarians only exist to serve the words we write. Statisticians exist to serve the numbers we collect. So if you want to do a PhD in statistics, I tell statistics students, you don't go and talk to the stats professors, you go to a meeting like this and you find out who's collecting interesting data and you, um, and you solve the problems associated with, with the interesting data that's been new data types that have been collected now. Not like my ruddy PhD, which was in imaginary data types which 40 years on still don't exist and never will. Right, so that's that, that sort of kind of is my story. So um, you, you, you need to uh, somehow encourage academics to get involved with solving the real problems and there's lots and lots of really, really interesting, valuable, worthwhile research stuff that, um, th that will generate papers in nature, but which is also solving real problems. You don't have to just do mm. esoteric stuff. So I, I, I go r right along with Tanya where he says, you don't sell yourself down the, down the road doing applied research. Some of the most interesting stuff you can ever think of doing, problems that you would never dream up yourself come from the, the real world. So that's nice stuff to do, I think. Thanks, Dan. The, the, the lesson I mean I, I've learned is it's not about the hard stuff. It's not about the infrastructure. It's about soft stuff. And one of the things that that one's got to learn is also about, unfortunately, about egos. Is that everybody wants to be the researcher, but somehow you need to let go of the ego to create that space for the partnership to work. Because if that is going to be the, the issue that you know, it's not going to work. There's no, there's no, you know, nobody's going to galvanize around a common issue. And I think what what it requires is it goes back to the issue of leadership. You know, to what extent are you willing to step back, let the partnership shine for the benefit of getting people to work and collaborate around a common cause. So I think that has been a, a very, a very hard and important lesson to learn as well. That is, as a, if you want to take the leadership role, you've got to, at times, just step back. Um, and not always seem to be standing in the front. Thanks. Chris, do you have a clear view? Thank you. So, uh, I have a, a short answer to that question. How do you uh, how do you bring academics into this uh, enterprise? And I also have a question for Tanya. Um, my answer, coming from an academic institution, first of all, uh, you, don't, you don't make the differentiation between applied research and basic research. Because I dare anybody to take any body of research and tell me whether it's basic or applied. The boundaries between the two are fuzzy, and eventually research will be applied or aspects of that research will be applied, and God, we hope so, uh, in one way, shape, or form. It may not be applied tomorrow, but sometimes it will be. It may be applied next month, next year, two years, ten years. You never know. It may build, it may uh, create the foundation for other research that can then be applied. So the separation into basic and applied is very simple, um, or simplistic, I would say. Second, I think uh, even in academia, you have to create a win-win situation to bring together um, uh, academics and folks who, who work in, in a wonderful institution like Sanby. Um, and the win-win situation is that every academic wants to see his or her research go forward, wants to see his or her research uh, headlined. 
and certainly wants to see his or her research eventually end up serving uh, the common good and improving the human condition. Again, maybe not right away, but certainly down the road. And say, for somebody at a university, SAMBI provides that opportunity in a win-win situation. Should that happen, then there's a much greater chance that that individual will be a lot more competitive in receiving funding for his or her research, either alone or in partnership with other researchers in that country or in partnership with uh, folks in, in, in other countries. Because this then becomes a proven track record of here's research that has led to a very interesting outcome that, is, uh, that has been applied in some way. Um, and this leads to my question for Tanya. One of the problems I think we have in the United States is we don't have those, I don't know what to call them, intermediary institutions or transitional institutions or translational institutions that effectively translate the research that academics do for policymakers and decision makers and policymakers in government. Uh, there are some NGOs who, who try to do that, but I would like Tanya to describe if she was designing such an institution from scratch that would translate what academics do and the research and the, the knowledge discoveries they make to policy makers and decision makers, what would that institution look like and who would it be populated with? I ironically um, was thinking about CSIR, which is the uh, <laughs> cultural scientific, what is it, I stand for? Industrial and industrial research. Industrial. Yeah, and it, that's research. And it, it, it is the, probably the biggest institution um, and has been around for a number of years and has a lot of funding and has a lot of competent and capable people. And probably in terms of national research, it's where some of the most interesting research is done on biological systems, environment, etc. Yet they choose to work with us because they don't have a direct link to policy. Uh, so, we might have much less money and much less people and m much smaller buildings, but we are in our sector in that space. And I wonder whether the legislation could have been interpreted in another way and whether we have not just pushed it you know our legislation is like a piece of string, and you know, there's a bit of an interpretation issue. We've pushed that role to be the intermediary. And so it is a combination of legislation a bit, leadership a bit, the messaging a bit, the relationships with others a bit, that all ends up us being in the space to influence, to take the science and develop tools or reports or a profile or a standing that then quite quickly translates into, into uh, policy. So the work on ecological infrastructure, for example, CSIR has got some of the best people, I've been, people like Belinda Rays and people like that, who have Bob Scholes and all of those guys. They're the, some of the best ecological research people in the country. But it's through us that it's become uh, now a national treasury budget item, ecological infrastructure, because we made the case. Um, so if I was to re recreate the institution, I think that the, the schizophrenic nature of the organization is a bit problematic, but now that I've, we've got it, I'm not sure we want to get rid of it. The fact that we've got these botanical gardens 
you know, it's a, it's a very different management demand to manage 11 botanical gardens than it is to do this value chain of information generation, analysis, access, dissemination, PR, positioning. It's a, it's a different uh, set of skills. And it's been a challenge, to be honest, to always try and make the link between the, bio, between the botanical gardens and the other work we do. And you almost have to manufacture the link. 